Good morning, command teams. Uh, this is General Andrea Tellis here at Air University. My command chief, Chief Stephen Blazer. And so first thing I'd like to do is say thank you. We have about um, 70 uh, call-ins connections on the line. I, I can't tell whether you're just one person or whether you're you're with your wingman out there. So that's a, it's a great turnout and I'm grateful because honestly, this is voluntary. Um, so Chief Blazer and I have been given this block of instruction to the command teams for just one year now. And we realized uh, as we were going through it that the commanders who were already in the seat um, and their command chiefs uh, missed the opportunity because we quite frankly didn't have the curriculum. It's taken us a while. Um, our Air Force has now put out doctrine on mission command. Um, it's a journey. Our, this block of instruction changes every time we give it. We get a little bit more. We learn, we learn a lot from the audience. And so the way this works is we're going to have about, um, I'd like to say about 30 minutes of discussion uh, that, that we'll talk through uh, what I'll call the lessons. And then it's open mic. So when I say open mic, you can send a question on, on chat. Um, you can come up voice if you'd like. Uh, and we'll try and steer the, the audience uh, where we can. I'm, I'm going to give Chief Blazer a minute here to introduce himself and talk about his part in this journey. And then I'll get back to what we're going to step through. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you might be tuning in from. I know we have a, a global audience. And so, uh, yeah, I just want to kind of take the chance to expand on this. You know, what we've gotten in some of the past uh, feedback from the courses is some people look at this like, uh, hey, this just sounds like leadership. Uh, this just sounds like the thing that like we're, we're kind of we're supposed to do. And so I, I, I would I would offer is, you know, as we work through this, um, you know, we have kind of different uh, communities and tribes and, and a lot of people with different experiences. And I think the big thing that's going on in our Air Force is really kind of asking ourselves, you know, how do we operate? Uh, who are we? You know, how do we function? And really taking a big look at that right now. And so I, I think it's just a really good opportunity for us to kind of level the bubble foundationally and really focus on how we execute the mission uh, in the best integrated way we can to deliver uh, capability to the nation. And I, and I know that's what we all come to work every day to do, but uh, I think the framework that, that has been put out, I think you know, that we'll, we'll get into, uh, it'll be interesting how you execute that in your different, uh, different mission areas, but just excited to have a conversation with you this morning and, uh, and, and move a little bit closer together. All right, so we're going to jump right into it. And I hope uh, for everyone who's dialed in that you had an opportunity to look at the placemat um, that was sent out as, as part of our prep for the course. Um, that's it. We don't have PowerPoint slides. Um, I'm not going to step you through doctrine. Uh, we're just going to talk through largely the principles and your role at the wing echelon and below um, for how we do this. So I want to start, uh, I'm a go big to small person, and I want to start with... Um, what our Secretary of the Air Force has said, you know, when he's visiting down here about um, how we are going to get the Air Force to what I'll call go back to its roots. Um, so Mission Command, uh, it's not an Army thing. I, I get that a lot. Hey, hey isn't that an Army thing? Um, yes, I think the Army has probably been practicing it uh, and calling it that longer than the Air Force. But the Air Force, if you go back in our DNA to our roots, um, there is no service that is better postured to leverage the concepts and principles of Mission Command. Um, you know, just our agility, our ability to make strategic impacts at the tactical level, um, our flexibility, and we have always relied uh, principally on concepts of decentralized execution, which I think is where we, we make our money, and that's the echelon we're going to talk about today the most. Um, so going back to our secretary, he was down here and he said, I, I feel like I'm the conductor of a symphony um, and I'm trying to get all the different sections of the symphony, you know, to be kind of playing the music in a manner which sounds right. And if all of the different musicians um, and the little teams are playing their own uh, their own tune um, or they can't read this, the music um, or they're just doing their own thing, you know, it sounds pretty horrible. And so if, if you think about Mission Command, um, what we're trying to do is principally, look, get all of our airmen to be able to read music in a, in a language where, look, if I, it doesn't matter what instrument you play. Um, if I put a sheet of music in front of you, you're, you're literate, you can read it. Um, and so that would be the start. Um, the next is we're an Air Force of small teams and we have a lot of different teams that do a lot of different things. And so that team um, has to be absolutely 
uh, in lockstep with each other. They have to know each other, they have to trust each other, and there has to be um, a clear understanding of, of what the mission is. And then when you cobble all those teams together, um, how do we synchronize that? And so um, as the wing commander echelon, uh, which even if you're a group commander or a vice wing commander, I'll, I'll kind of get to that. Um, that's what we're really going to talk about today. We want to make this about what your roles are and how you can make a daily difference in the ability of your airmen um, to execute mission command. Um, so here's the, here's the hashtag for the day. Don't overthink it. Like, honestly, I've given this, this presentation, you know, I want to say six times and about 10 minutes into it is when I start getting the, is that it? Like, is that really all we're talking about? Um, I go back to the army doesn't even think about this because they don't overcomplicate it. Um, you know, we, we have SAS here and they could give you a PhD dissertation that will make your head hurt on mission command. Um, it is not complicated. And when I say, when I step through, you know, some of the principles, you're literally going to be thinking, that's it. Yes, that's it. Um, you can use uh, this practice with, if you have kids with, with your young kids, right? Like it can apply in the household. Um, so it can absolutely apply if you're someone out there going, uh, well, I'm a fill in the blank officer. Our wing is a fill in the blank wing. Our group is a fill in the blank group. Um, yes, you can do it. This is not about operators. This is not about an AFSC. Um, it is applicable across our force. Um, we did, you know, big, big moment. So I'm going to hold this up. If you haven't seen, we have published doctrine. Um, for those of you that like a hard copy reference, you, you can get it published. Um, there is a QR code on the back. And if you go to the LeMay Center's website, um, you can access it online. Um, it's not just uh, the, the words, there's, there's narratives in there, there's examples, there's stories. And uh, if I could put a plug in on the LeMay Center website, there is a podcast out there um, that General Webb, when he was, uh, you know, he was our AETC commander, but it is principally about his experience, his experiences post 9-11 when he was the AFSOC commander, or when he was in AFSOC, in JSOC. Um, and it is a very good explanation of commander's intent and mission type orders. And I'll get to that, but it's a, you know, it's a short podcast that's easily consumable and is something that I think uh, any unit can relate to. Um, so that's a shameless plug for that. Okay, so let me go back to uh, mission command being a philosophy. You can see that um, at the banner at the top of the placemat. Um, and there's, there's a, a few things I say about philosophy. Um, Lots of people like to study philosophies. Um, academia has a lot written about a wide variety of philosophies. Um, we will only be successful with the philosophy of mission command if we actually practice it. We can't just study it and talk about it. So this is step one. Um, we are an Air Force of practitioners. Um, we do have a small subset of our force which is here in the classroom teaching. And that's great, but those teachers also go back and forth between our operational force to be practitioners. So um, all of us as leaders have a responsibility to be coaches, leaders, mentors, educators, and I would say you are, you are the secret sauce in the ability of your wings um, to actually practice um, mission command. So um, I'm gonna stop there and, and hand off to, to Blaze and let him talk a little bit about the the whole command team experience and whatever else he wants to fill in. Yes, ma'am. I, I think this is the, you know, we've even had a, I, I remember when we visited the Chief Leadership Academy and kind of the roles between, um, you know, the SEL and, and the commander and, and as far as, um, you know, how we execute as a team. And, and one thing I appreciated, ma'am, is, uh, you know, in some ways, um, especially when it comes to education, you know, strategery, you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, you do get into a, a, a position to where, you know, and I remember, we, we are definitely trying to get our, our senior list leaders to be more strategically aware and oriented. But, you know, you gave the team pretty, pretty uh, blunt feedback that at the end of the day, the role is to get out and execute, to actually go and to do things. And I think that's the, really the big point um, on the, the difference between philosophy and making sure it's a practice. Because a lot of times we can just send out an email, we can build some document, um, you know, but, it, but it, it's just PowerPoint deep. Um, it's just it's just bumper sticker deep. 
And it's got to be to the point where we look at our rehearsals, our exercises, you know, those kind of things. We're actually getting airmen to get, as you talk about, reps and sets uh, to, to start to discover how they can team together, how they can, how they can at different levels across organizations, across units, uh, to operate more a, a, as a team. You know, uh, General Slife talk, talks pretty uh, openly about how we've just over-functionalized everything and how we, you know, organize forces. And, and we really struggle and all that stuff kind of just goes up the org chart uh, to the decision makers. And that's not how we want to be if we're going to execute mission command. And so those are the kind of things I think about, man, is about team, teaming at Echelon. Um, I don't know if you want to discuss with them your views on, you know, sometimes people think that we just need to flatten everything. But how having actual Echelon is important to execute mission command, especially when you look at missions and functions. Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a good lead in for, for where we're going here, because... Um, so you'll, you'll see from the handouts, so the, the principles of mission command uh, are, are spread out across um, really three broad uh, constructs. The hierarchy goes from centralized uh, command, which again, you need to see prefix for that. So you don't have centralized command before uh, lower than in our Air Force, generally a squadron commander. Um, which is our principal fighting force. That's where we will win or lose our next conflict. But when we talk about mission command and centralized command, we're predominantly talking about MAGCOM commanders and higher, the highest echelons. Um, when we get to distributed control, um, I could make the argument that even wing commanders in some cases do not, cannot exercise distributed control. We're talking about um, apportionment of forces, um, dispersal of forces. It just depends what kind of wing you are. This is where I say our Air Force has kind of sliced and diced itself down to a very wide range of um, organizational structures and mission sets. So if you're a flying wing, you might be able to apportion forces. Um, if you're a functional wing, you might have all your forces uh, sitting in front of you in one location and, and, you know, and struggle. If you had to disperse your mission, you'd, you'd find yourself in a unique place. Um, so what I say is the, the MAGCOM headquarters, in some cases the NAF commanders, are trying to get their heads around what distributed control looks like and, and how they issue that type of guidance. But predominantly, the wings and, and the groups and the squadrons you are in the business of decentralized execution, um, all the way down to the airmen. So your airmen are capable of executing mission command. Um, I'll get to that again. The, the scope of that is going to vary. And we'll talk about a concept which I'll reference as speed of maneuver. It's why we are doing this. Um, we have got to be agile. We believe we are going to be functioning in a degraded communication environment that in a, in a high-end conflict, um, you are going to be disconnected from your possibly your next higher, your next lower, and it could be laterally, which is why it's so important that we simplify your communication requirements. Um, flat communication is great if the flat level that you're communicating with has the same level of experience and competency um, as everyone else at that level. And right now, we don't have that. We have wide disparities between ranks, um, levels of experience, types of experience, um, skill level, and communicating. You have to communicate those things multiple times in very different ways in order to get all of those individuals or activities moving at the same speed. So you'll hear me say, trust plus training equals speed of maneuver. Your role as commanders is to evaluate the ability of your subordinate echelons. What is their level of training? And trust is a factor of unit cohesion, right? We'll, we'll get to that. How fast can they capably move? Um, if you move them too quickly, you start to see signs of failure to execute the mission. If they move too quickly in a manner in which they're not trained, worst case, you're talking uh, risk to mission, risk to force, fatalities, mishaps, etc. If you move too slowly because you're moving at the pace of the least common denominator, 
you may not be able to accomplish your mission set in the timelines that your command has asked you, um, which is probably a factor of training and trust. So to get there, sets and reps, I go back to sets and reps. So we'll start with um, the two most important factors that I think if you look at the principles on the left-hand side, um, for the audience here today, clear commander's intent is, is I can't foot stomp that enough. If you have, if you as a commander, if you're one of the commanders on the line, and so I should say at this point, if you're a vice wing commander, I treat you like the commander. Um, you, you have to get inside your commander's head and understand um, what their intent is and be able to, on a moment's notice, parrot it. Uh, you're the one who's out there, an extra set of eyes and ears, um, but you're doing the best that you can to facilitate that commander's um, intent. So being clear, being concise, um, how do you evaluate whether, whether your wing or whether your group is actually understanding your intent? You got to get out and look at it. You got to see it. You got to walk around. You have to watch your mission happen and you have to ask. Like go out and ask a captain what your intent is and you'll be surprised at what you hear back. Um, it doesn't matter what your mission set is. And you can, you can evaluate this daily. Um, and I'll say at this point, your, your wing or group's operating speed and ability is a little bit of a sine wave um, based on time of year and cycle. So uh, if you don't believe your wing uh, hits a, a little dip in the summer when we're in the peak turnover of commanders and PCS cycle, um, you need to factor that in. What percentage of your personnel turnover and how long does it take for them to get up to speed? Um, clear commander's intent through that period of time is absolutely essential. Um, we're going into an Afrogen cycle. Um, we're going to have sine waves in, in levels of training. Um, you're going to have to be able to understand what's the water line, how fast can we move, what are our gaps in training, and what can we do to fill those gaps at various times in whatever your wing or group's battle rhythm um, looks like. So very important that you understand commander's intent. Um, commander, clear commander's intent could be three words. Right? It could be five words. Um, the shorter, the better. It shouldn't be a dissertation or a long paragraph. Uh, I go back to General Webb's you know, podcast. His, his orders on the morning of 9-11 after the towers were hit were go help New York. Um, he had a, you know, he's taken off MH-53s from McGuire, Dick Slayhurst, and, and that's all he got. And so um, is that perfect? No, but it, at the time, it was necessary and sufficient. And so he got his, uh, his team ready and they flew north. And so they, they you know, that's step one, um, get people moving. And in circumstances like that, um, maneuver is more important than direction, right? You, you got to get the team moving, um, especially if you're in a situation of, uh, of survival mode. So move. Um, and then figure out course corrections from there. So let me let me let Blaze fill in. Ma'am, I, uh, I uh, and when it comes to this topic, I, I think uh, you know, and many times, you know, and we've talked a little bit about how kind of we're raised in the Air Force. You know, you, you we all kind of have a common accession source somewhat, and then we go to off to our different uh, initial skills training and and functional training. And so I, I think it then starts to get into a little bit of, about our identity and what we do. Uh, in different areas, uh, and there's there's some there's a lot of goodness in that in terms of having pride in our professions, um, but I really do see once it starts going up to a leadership level, you know, when it comes down to commander's intent and some of the language that we talk about risk and uh, risk to to force risk to mission that that was a language where I did not hear a lot very much growing up, and I just had to learn it wasn't until I got next to a commander, and so I would say it's really important to your point about what I've learned. Um, in, in my time at serving next to a commander is, is, you know, once you have a commander's intent, it really is my role, particularly to be that communicator, that integrator, and that synchronizer, because the, the SEL will have greater access traditionally than, than the commander. Um, and I think particularly the, lo the higher that commander goes up on the org chart, you know, the, the organization will just react differently 
Uh, and, but so the so the command chief or the SEL has has a much different kind of ability to to move around the organization and to see how that commander's intent is really being executed in, in reality and what's that feedback loop and and how how the teams are are, are flowing on that. Uh, one thing that I think is is uh, is really important too in this in this business is. You know, there, everybody comes to work and there's usually a stack of AFIs or a stack of uh, things that are just out there that have been historical guidance that the commander has no idea even are existing in some cases. And, and I've seen it how that, and this is where the bureaucracy sets in, is, you know, people will be taking orders from things that were written down in, in pieces of paper years and years ago that just bankrupt the ability of the organization to move. And I think it's really important, and I've seen several times, man, where you've had to kind of inject in and say, hey, let's stop. We're actually, we're actually moving away from what we're trying to do in the first place. I think, I think that has to be done. I think that's critical, whether that's the SEL or anything, is you know, where are the orders even coming from uh, in, in terms of, of the execution side? And then, and then the, other, the other thing that came to mind when you were talking about General Webb, ma'am, is, is you know, we had a shared experience in BMT at COVID. And so you were the second Air Force commander. I was in the 37 training wing as the command chief. And uh, I, I will say that the 37 training wing, it is an <clears throat> amazing, amazing mission set, but I never would have expected when across the street, when we started filling up lodging with uh, some of the, um, the evacuees from, uh, from, from uh, um, the cruise ships and everything from China, that fast forward 30 days that we were gonna be having MTIs and trainees in those, in those facilities. And I remember when you and General Wed came and you gave us very clear guidance and it was, it was fight through. We had to keep the pipeline open and fight through and the priority for us did really shift. It was, it was more about safety and security of America's sons and daughters um, versus training. And we had to keep the pipeline moving. We were, we, and in some cases, I never would have expected that we actually had, we had units telling us to slow down the pipeline because they couldn't receive them uh, you know, uh, uh, that well. And uh, well, we didn't slow down, I'll just tell you that, because they, they were in the pipeline and they were coming and we were training in there and they were coming your way. But um, those are some things that I, I reflect back, ma'am, that I think it's really important to have to shift to what is the main thing and make sure everybody understands the main thing. Yeah, so um, again, if you, if you don't have a one line um, distilled down uh, phrase, I'd say, that it that describes your mission whatever that is to your wing or group um i'd spend some time trying to get there uh, and it should be understandable uh, to someone in in that has no military affiliation <laughs> you should it should be your tagline that that your pa um, section can put out and at least an image of what that is comes into someone's mind um, I'm going to transition to how do you issue that to a unit? What are mission type orders? Because I think that's, you know, the second ingredient here. If you're going to give clear commander's intent, um, you should be doing so in a manner which, if possible, leverages mission type orders. Mission type orders don't have to be a plan ord, X ord, five paragraph format. Um, mission type orders just enable um, your subordinates to speak the same language and understand the direction of travel. Again, it, it, it should clearly convey commander's intent and some right left limits. It provides steerage. It's the minimal amount of guidance and, and direction that you can give so that your subordinate commanders have the ability to like, if you look at it as driving down the highway, Look, just stay within the lines. You can change lanes, but you're just setting the lines and the direction of travel and let them um, do their best um, to, to keep the car moving down the road um, at, at an acceptable pace and, you know, honestly, and not crash. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll say, though, uh, we are struggling with this because for a long time now, I guess it, it's probably a couple decades um, the Air Force has come up with its own lexicon and its own way of communicating that is somewhat unintelligible to the Joint Force. The, we're, we're talking about this right now. Um, some of that was for a good reason. We, st we stood up this thing called an Air Expeditionary Force. We went to AEF cycles. There's not another service that operates on that construct. And year on year, we developed our own language. And lo and behold, you wake up a couple decades later and we're wholly unfamiliar with the GFM process and some of the, the language and the, the, me the mechanics that the Joint Force uses. And we're having to relearn that. 
Um, so I go back to, it doesn't matter what wing or group you're in, we have to be speaking the same language. And the language we're talking about needing our airmen to be able to, to speak, um, depending on their rank and level of responsibility, is, is things like the joint planning process. They have to understand orders. How do you read an order? Um, how do you speak in an order? What is a warning order, planning order, X order, a task order? Um, these types of things enable us to move at speed. Once you have a well-written X org, someone only has to add a task org to it. I mean, it is a very fast process. Um, what hurts us is when, uh, when we have units of activity that say, oh, well, that's not the fill in the blank way. That's not the Little Rock way. That's not how we do it here. That's not the Offit way. Um, your wings are going to have to tailor your activities to your mission set and location. That's undeniable. You are going to have different outputs, requirements, activities than another wing. But the language that you convey that in should be standardized. So that when your airmen PCS from one wing to another, they may be asked to operate differently, but the way in which we're communicating those requirements is the same. And they don't have to learn a new language every time they PCS. And they, we certainly can't have them having to learn a new language when they have to serve within a joint or combined force because they will not have time. And what we're hearing is our airmen are behind. They can't run at pace because they're spending three to six months learning the language of the joint organization and then they accelerate. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they're not capable of operating at the same level as our joint or combined partners. They absolutely are. We're infusing this now into every echelon of PME and foundational training. So our second lieutenants are now getting this at OTS. We're working on ROTC. Um, our enlisted force is getting this in the enlisted echelons of PME. Our captain's course here at SOS, ACSC, where our gaps are, are in some of our courses that are distance learning. So our ARC component gets the overwhelming majority of its PME through distance learning. And so all of that courseware is being updated to infuse this. But, you know, this I sound like a broken record when I say, if our airmen are only getting this when they come to Air University for in-residence PME, or during those episodic courses that they take um, across the span of their career, then it's gonna be insufficient. They need sets and reps. And so the, our wings, the operational force is really where they get culture. Um, that's where the mission happens. Um, I joke that no one, no one joins the Air Force so that they can either come to Second Air Force or Air University just to spend their whole career in the institutional force. It's, it's not what they want to do nor what they should do. Um, we're giving them a toolkit here. And so when we teach people the basics of mission type orders, um, if they're not using it in their units, it's going to attrit out and it's, it's just gonna be that book that you throw on the shelf um, and don't open. I go back to this as a practice and we have to give our airmen um, practice every day. Yes, ma'am, the only thing I think I'll add on, um, you know, before we, we transition to um, shared understanding is I do think that the, the term of this is a language is, is the most accurate term to describe it by, and particularly, um, and, and with that, it's gonna have a learning curve. Just if you were gonna throw somebody into a foreign country or foreign area and they struggle with the language, you know, we described the joint force a little bit, it, it is that learning curve. But the point is we, we have to make sure, you know, that, that language is gonna stay that language. It, it's not gonna adjust for us. And, and particularly as we look to be more integrated with the joint force, you know, I think it's just gonna have to take a commitment and, and um, PME is definitely doing its part, I think for, for everyone, all the leadership teams tuning in. Um, but just also understanding is, you know, we're working hard to de design a continuum to where we have greater touch points, but a lot of this stuff is gonna have to be practiced and involved in it at, at the institutional, at, at the base level. And so we're working hard at our university to provide um, tools and materials to push that out, particularly for the enlisted force uh, through foundations and uh, hopefully all the teams are, are online are tracking that, the 300, 500, 700, but about that that NCO and that senior, senior NCO level is where we're definitely gonna be pushing the joint planning process. Um, but I just ask everybody to, uh, um, you know, to kind of even maybe canvas your formations and, and, and see, hey, how much do they know? 
Um, you know, some some formations we're seeing when they come into the uh, senior NCO academy, some people are hearing it for the first time, and then some people were introduced to it as staff sergeant. So it really is going to depend on, like you said, man, the experience and maybe the background of those individuals. Um, but we got to get to a point where. Uh, as, as people are going up in leadership positions, it is just common at every layer. And that's where we're working, um, at, at, particularly on the illicit side. All right, so I'm going to call an audible because this is the first time we've done this remotely and I'm dying here, getting no, I'm getting no feedback. Like I have no idea what's going out in, in virtual land. So I think it, because of those, those are the, really the two bedrock foundational principles that I want to give the, the classroom here an opportunity to ask questions or make comments and see if we can... Uh, get some discussion going before before we move on to um, shared understanding and mutual mutual trust. Um, so I'm going to ask my support staff back there if anyone typed anything on the screen that no questions. We got nothing. You guys haven't had your either we'll first, give them time. first I th cup I think of coffee, they, they second cup of coffee from earlier. I'm sure everybody's rushing to the yeah. keyboard, man. Hopefully you're not driving home. So uh, you're not dialed in like as you're as you're driving. So I don't know that they're rushing to the keyboard, you know, like, uh, be no least, one wants to be the be person least that asked that first question. Okay. So, um, I'm going to move on until we actually get a first question. And then I'm, I'm going to rely on the staff here. If one comes in, um, to kind of just say break, break. There is one. All question. right. We got I knew it. One. See, I was I betting. It. I was betting yeah, on it. We were betting. Is there any discussion in senior leader circles regarding lowering tier levels on AFI waiver? Yeah, so the question, if you couldn't hear that, is is there a discussion at senior officer levels about lowering the tiers for waiver authorities in AFIs? And so I will share a comment. I can't attribute it, and what, what happens at Corona generally stays at Corona. But there was a comment made at, the, at Corona that we just need to burn down all our AFIs and start over. So yes, um, there is there is gross dismay at the proliferation of AFIs. Um, we have AFIs right now that actually contradict, directly contradict each other. Um, so one functional rights, one AFI that completely contradicts another AFI. Um, it's sort of AFIs gone mad. Um, the challenge is where to start. Um, and yes, uh, I think there is an understanding that the tiering of AFIs and, and quite frankly, the ownership of AFIs in some cases, who owns what um, policy is all under discussion. Um, I can't speak to the timing or the process for how we will go about um, revisiting our AFIs, but uh, I, I can also tell you there is um, angst, I'll call it, over how long it takes to change it. You know, so it's it's unacceptable that we have, you know, guidance memorandums on top of guidance memorandums because we can't get an AFI actually updated. Um, it's really a descriptor of how badly the the a, the bureaucracy has proliferated, um, and it speaks to the flatness because if you're in the Pentagon, instead of really just having five or seven organizations you needed to coordinate with, now you have like 25, uh, and it takes forever. Um, and we have swung the pendulum too far to consensus and adjudicated too much. So at some point, uh, someone has to be in charge and they make a decision and we move out. And if you don't agree with it, you can express your views. But once you've expressed your views, um, you might just be told this is this is the way we have to do it um, because we're, we're kind of at a stalemate. So I don't know if you want to pile on that, but, you know, the tiering, um, it brings up a good a, a sub comment though. So I will say um, how how mission command can go wrong is if you it is not simply delegating authority down to the lowest level. That is quite frankly dangerous. Um, there are reasons why authorities are retained at certain echelons of command. And I go back to it's a it's a level of competence and confidence. And confidence correlates to experience. And so there's a reason why wing commanders and group commanders are the only ones who can make certain decisions um, and, and have that level of responsibility on them. Um, I give the example, you know, the flying community is, is sort of easy pickings because you don't, you don't take a, an aviator who just got out of UPT and make them the soft. 
It doesn't mean they don't understand how to take off and land, and but they're they're really not well suited. You don't want the second lieutenant, um, who's Deniff for a few days, signing off on orders at the scheduling desk. Um, that's not an appropriate second lieutenant aviator task. Um, there's experience levels there and risk associated with that. So you're not empowering them by doing that. You're actually setting them up for failure and absorbing an extraordinary amount of risk that is likely unnecessary. So I'd ask you to think about the things in your mission sets um, that are like that and to understand tiering of AFI waiver authorities might be there for a reason. There are quite a bit of them that I would argue are at the wrong echelon. We, we just are holding everything too centralized. Um, but if you're at the wing um, and you are a waiver authority, I would certainly have a conversation with your commanders before you delegate that authority if, if you are able to, um, to a lower echelon. You have to be comfortable with the level of risk that that brings. Thanks for that question. Two additional questions. All right, um, bring it on. Two questions. In, in the context of your previous remarks, uh, would, you, would you say uh, that the same applies for having a tagline for civilian directors? Uh, so I don't actually make a distinction between civilian directors and commanders. Um, they certainly have, so if you didn't hear the question is, is there a difference between a tagline uh, that commanders would have versus civilian directors with re as it relates to the mission set? Um, civilian directors might not have uh, the UCMJ authorities that a commander has as it relates to authorities over mil uniformed military personnel, but they have the same level of responsibility as it relates to getting the mission done. And they have the same level of responsibility to have their unit of activity um, trained and ready. Uh, so a civilian director uh, should have the same ability to communicate uh, what is our mission, how are we connected to the mission above us and to our left and right, um, and how do we execute that mission? And so I would say, no, I don't, I don't make a difference between a a civilian director, and I, I have a number of civilian directors here, and they are highly competent and confident and capable. And so, um, and they're very passionate. And some of them uh, have some military experience and some of them have none, um, but they've, they've embraced the language of mission type orders um, and what our objective is here, which is to effectively deliver air power so we are we are practitioners in the art and science of air power wherever you are otherwise i'm sorry you join you're, you're working for the wrong organization right like so at some point whether you're in the air force or the space force we may have some guardians on the line with us um we're all aiming uh to be that that partner in the joint force that is air-minded and and brings expertise um on, on air power. So yeah, I think our civilians are, are in this fight right alongside us. Second question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so once again, in the context of your remarks, what are some key tasks that squadron commanders can begin to move out on now? Okay, love it. I get this question. I speak to every SOS class and the captains, every class I get, what can I do? And so brilliant. This gets to um, shared understanding and mutual trust. So our squadron commanders, and I say more importantly, the, our NCO Corps and our company grade officer corps, they have to get up every day and say, what can I do today to make my airmen better? And it doesn't take a phase two ORI, a NATO TAC eval, um, you don't have to aggregate your force and do a wing level exercise to do that. Um, it can be very simple. So it's about, we just got through Thanksgiving. It's about to be the holidays. I would venture to guess every squadron out there is planning some form of a holiday party. I would bet my next paycheck that if you have an officer or an NCO who uses the joint planning process to plan their holiday party, it will be fantastic. 
You will not run out of fill in the blank food. Um, people will not show up at the wrong time. Um, you will have a committee formed that actually achieves the objective, which is have fun, you know, come together. Um, all of those skill sets that go into planning a holiday party and executing a holiday party are 100% transferable to whatever process your organization uses under your wartime construct. It doesn't even have to be the wartime construct. It could be generate sorties. It could be you're a logistician and you're, you're in supply chain. It could be you're a depot line. It could be, you know, I'm a laboratory and I'm trying to find a solution to, you know, hypersonics. Um, honestly, it can be anything. I have said for, for those of us in the room who have been a snacko and who remember the best and the worst snackos, being a good or bad snacko is a predictor of how well you will, you will do executing the joint planning process. So um, I say, get simple. I don't care if it's, we're talking about a personnelist in the MPF doing customer service. Like there is a process there. Get your airmen to exercise process discipline. Understand what it is that their mission set is and make them better. Um, it could be, a 10 minute huddle in the morning with a lesson learned. It can be a 10 minute huddle at the end of the day to say, debrief, how did we do today? What went well? What didn't go well? Um, whoever the second in charge is in an office, when I say in an office, it could be a staff sergeant or a tech sergeant. I, if the supervisor says, hey, you know what? Tomorrow, I'm not gonna be in. I've got this and that to do, you're in charge. Tell me what you're gonna do. What's your mission? How are you going to run the office? Let them do it. Disappear for three hours, come back and see how things are going. You do not want to do that under the worst of, of um, high end conflict conditions. You want that stress to be placed on them um, in a controlled, contained environment where if the rails start to come off, you're actually in the background ready to kind of catch them and coach them through it. And so that's what I'd say a squadron commander um, should be doing every day. Now, I go back to their first 90 days, whenever that is or was. The first thing they need to do with their senior enlisted leader at their side is evaluate where their unit is right now. Right now, where are they? On that spectrum of readiness, competence, capability, confidence. Um, so, so let me dovetail this into shared understanding and mutual trust. I'm a firm believer every unit needs a playbook. Like just like a, you know, you can use the football analogy. Whoever you are out there right now and whatever your mission set is, you need to know and you need to have five to seven plays that your organization can execute blindfolded and get it right. Very simple, on task, on mission, simplicity. Once you have that, now you can start reaching into the playbook and doing things that are more complicated. But if you misevaluate the, the confidence and competence of your organization and you're breaking out those, you know, your 200 plays into the playbook before they've got five to seven plays down, it is not going to work. You're going to be exceedingly frustrated. You're not going to understand why you're, you're, there's sand in the engine and things aren't running smoothly. Keep it simple. Once you get there, um, yeah, you can throw a few, um, a few plays in, but if championship teams, highly functional teams are brilliant at the basics and they don't get to be championship teams if they can't do the basics. They just can't, you can't go from not having um, foundational skills, which are both with occupational skills on top of them to being, you know, the highest performing team uh, in whatever your specialty is. And, and that I would say is specialty agnostic. Um, you know what your squadron commander's uh, mission sets are and what the key ingredients are um, for, for making them brilliant at the basics. Uh, and I would, I would say at the group level, the group commander and the group SEL, and certainly the wing commander and the wing SEL, you can walk into an organization that is whatever your flavor of organization is and know very quickly, is this an where, that, where that organization is? You can kind of smell it. It has a look and feel. Details matter. Do they have process discipline? Is there good order and discipline, right? Are your airmen motivated? Are they inquisitive? 
Are they seeking knowledge and learning? Are they getting better every day? What is the command climate? All of those things are what is, a, is what fosters mutual trust. Mutual trust occurs when an airman is just so focused on their task, on being brilliant at whatever they are responsible for doing, that they firmly believe whoever their airman is to their left and right, they got it, right? You're trusting that everyone in the organization is doing their job. That's when you start to get complementary mission effects. Um, that's trust. And it takes daily repetitions. Um, and you, you, you have to get to know the people. It requires intrusive leadership and a firm understanding of the skill levels of the people around you. I know you want to pile onto that. That's like, this is one of your favorites. So. It is, man. Yeah. Um, I think for both of these, you know, shared understanding, mutual trust, you can really can't, you can't get to the other stuff because these are the two that I think that are all about culture, man. Um, you know, this is, this is where, like you said, I mean, I, I've had a chance to be a, a wing command chief twice and I could go into a squadron, whether it was local, uh, afar, and within minutes, you can assess where that team's at, particularly on these two. Um, you know, are they are just kind of off in the corners, people doing their own things? Is there actually some mutual trust? And, and to your point about you got to be brilliant at the basics. Uh, I, I, will, I will say two basics in my mind, ma'am, ma that I think that, that we honestly, we, we look past far too often, our sponsorship and feedback. You know, onboarding, offboarding, how we, how we on, bring a family on, um, those things, if you do that well as an organization, uh, it's your first sign of trust and welcoming them and understand why they're so important to whatever the purpose of, of your mission is. And I've just seen incredible results when people do that effectively. The same thing on feedback, you know, when we actually own up to, and, and, and our airmen know the AFIs, they know when they're supposed to be getting feedback and they know when, when that isn't valued in an organization. And that should just be a part, a natural part of both informal and formal feedback loops, you know, where we're sitting down and, and, and getting that interaction to actually maximize the potential that's out there towards the goals, the common goals of the organization. And absolutely, man, if we, if we can't come true on that, then I think the next two, two items on the chart, you're never gonna have that where there's that shared trust and understanding. And, and I think just a mutual respect to challenge people to reach their maximum potential. Because you can't look at stripes, you can't look at a surf and really see the true potential of anybody. It's all going to be discovered in this in this area. Um, and, and, and again, I, I think, ma'am, yes, we could spend a lot of time on this. I think a lot of people who are online have a lot of personal examples of the of the of the units they've been into. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, it is about how we all become in alignment. Um, and that's got to be done at, 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 at an appropriate level. But but I would just say to your point on back to the basics, I would just offer to anybody online. If you take a look at sponsorship and feedback, I, I think those you'll be able to assess uh, trust and understanding pretty quickly. Yeah, so um, one of the other things I hear from talking to, you know, whether it's the captains, the majors, it doesn't matter what echelon, I hear, one, I don't have time, right? I don't have time. So time is a choice, right? What I say is, um, it is a commander's job um, to establish priorities uh, so the training of, you can't not have time to properly train your airmen, right? There, it, is, it is a fundamental responsibility that we have. So the question is, uh, what is a lower priority task that I guarantee you right now someone is doing, right? The, the, there is something going on in your squadron. Um, they will do what you set as a priority. If you make it a priority and you don't do it, guess what? They're not going to do it because they're not going to believe like that's the say do gap. So if you make it a priority, you have got to walk that walk and you have to actually show them that they eat, that you are giving them the time and the resources and I'll get the resources to do it. Um, there is not a big uh, room full of money and manpower somewhere sitting around for us to send to your wings. So you are going to have to find a way to do this within the resources that you have today. Um, does the Air Force want to grow? Absolutely. Um, that takes years to affect. So I go back to what can I do for my airmen today? 
and keep it simple. It doesn't cost a lot of money and it doesn't take a lot of resources to simply use your work centers, use the mission sets that you have, and to come up with creative ways to give them a task, teach them the task, supervise the task, and then give them feedback on how they're doing the task. And the task doesn't have to be complicated, and it actually doesn't have to directly correlate to the mission. Find a parallel. Um, there's, there's plenty of ways to do that that are actually fun. Um, I default to unit PT because you, you learn a ton about your organization when you just try and actually get them to be able to show up for PT. You will find out who has childcare problems, who has other issues that causes them not be able to show up. Um, who's actually not as fit as what their PT test score um, says they were nine months ago. Um, it conversations happen there that have nothing to do with PT that give you insight into an individual's life. If PT is not the way to do it, you know, I get this from like, honestly, the space force is like, yeah, we're not really into PT. Can you give us something else we can do? Hey, go to an escape room. Like our airmen love that. Now you can actually use your GPC card in your unit, call it a leadership development activity and go and do that. Um, find ways to do team building exercises in environments that your organization um, embraces. It can be anywhere, um, but you actually have to walk about, talk about, and learn what are those places, what are those settings, what, do, what does your organization of today, what incentivizes them to come together? Because you have to build connectedness and you have to orient them towards the mission. But the concept of plan, train, rehearse, execute, and debrief, like that's it. That It doesn't get, there's nothing more complicated than that. Um, and you can break that down into the smallest of tasks that are a building block for whatever it is you do. And so I think we have another question. Yes, ma'am. We do. Um... There's actually a little dialogue in the chat going on with regard to the following. How do we incentivize mission command vis-a-vis uh, -vis an airman's perception of risk from the Air Force? Okay, so I had risk acceptance as my last topic to talk about, So, but I'm going to go to it now. So we're an hour in. Um, and I, I love this kind of Q&A thing. So we're, we're not following the syllabi, which this, hey, this is what you get when you get an AU commander that progress, has never been an instructor. Progress unhindered you know, by I custom. Have three creds. So this is what we do. Um, all right, so let's go to risk acceptance. So I go back to, um, you, you have to be careful not to place responsibility um, and mission in the hands of a team or an airman who are not trained and experienced to execute whatever it is that is the level of your asking. Now, this is kind of the opposite scenario where you're telling an airman, which again, like if they're signed off, they should be task ready, right? Some supervisor has said, this is a mission ready airman here and you're saying go. And what you're seeing is they're not moving. Like they're, let's just call them risk averse. They perceive a risk that you don't see. So this is my quintessential answer, an example of the electrified fence. So I don't know how many of you are dog owners out there. I've got canine in my background. And so we see this in the security forces world. Um, and so here's the example I'm gonna give you. For about 20 years now, we have raised uh, canines that have been trained with an electric fence. And the electric fence is up in the yard and by God, they are not gonna go across the street in front of them because they know they're gonna get zapped. Um, and so we've zapped them if they've tried to go across the street. And so they're dutifully staying in the yard. Now we're trying to get our airmen to practice the principles of mission command. And so what's the first thing we did? We took down the electric fence. And so the fence is down and we're like, hey, run, right? You're free. As, as, if you believe you can get across the road, go. And then we're shocked when the dog just sits there and is like, I'm not going across that road. I watched, you know, Fido over there go across the road and he got zapped, not happening. And so uh, we came to this realization. And so bring all the commanders in, what do you do? Hey, one, you need to walk across the street. Show the team that they can actually navigate themselves across the street. 
look both ways, you know, show the right way of doing it, go across the street, come back. Step two, snap the leash on Fido and lead them across the street, right? So you have to do this. We have to break the habit pattern. The habit pattern is, I'm not going across the street because I'm going to get zapped. Now, here's the other thing that happens. Fido is going to have Rover next door who's, you know, been locked in the yard for a year and Rover's not going to look both ways and Rover's going to bolt across the street and it's going to end badly, right? Rover gets hit by a car. You can't summarily execute all the dogs for running across the street if we just took the fence down. Like there has to be a meaningful lesson there. Get your arms around them, show them, hey, you know, that, that's not the way you do that. Um, otherwise, we're just going to have and people parked in the yard. They are not going to move. Um, we have to gently move them along. Now, once I said before, movement is a little bit more important than direction right now because the herd has been settled and we're trying to get them to move. Um, once you have them moving, then you have to, you have to shape it a little bit. Um, at some point, that airman, you gotta understand why. Why are they not moving? Do they not have the self-confidence? Do they need sets and reps? Do they want to see another airman do it? Your airmen are all learned in different ways, right? So you got to kind of crack the code on the airmen. Um, I wouldn't overgeneralize by saying all of the airmen aren't moving, right? There are informal leaders within that collection of airmen. This is where I say the command chiefs should be like dying to, to pipe up here. You have to know who the informal leaders amongst those airmen are. Who's that senior airman who's most likely to be staff sergeant first? Um, this is what I call peer policing. Peer policing is one of the most important factors that I think our Air Force has lost. I could go on for hours, right? And one of the reasons why our squadron commanders don't have time is because they're having to do policing that should be happening horizontally at every echelon below them. Our majors should be policing our majors. Our captains should be policing our captains and our lieutenants should be policing our lieutenants. And they are not to the degree that we need them to. They're expecting the supervisor to do it. They're expecting the leadership to do it. And that level of passivity is hurting us. If we can identify the informal leaders amongst them and start that back up, it will become contagious. And the other less confident leaders will start gaining some confidence and the herd stops moving. Um, so again, it's you have to know your people. They are all not going to want to move. Um, you have to find the ones that are willing and, and leverage them. And, and then honestly, if someone just is intransigent and refuses to move, that's an accountability issue. So hold them accountable. Um, you shouldn't have to issue orders multiple times. A staff sergeant shouldn't have to tell a collection of airmen multiple times um, what their responsibilities are uh, and before they start holding them accountable for, for not um, accomplishing the mission in the manner that, that you need them to accomplish it. Any other, yeah. any other questions right now? I, the, the thing that, I, that I'll add, ma'am, is... Uh, there's, there's a specific line in the memo that General Brown put out um, on Mission Command, and it talks to the compliance conundrum. <laughs> and, I, and I think this also speaks to, you know, we, we've heard kind of what you, you deserve, what you tolerate. Uh, the former SEAC said that. And, and I, I remember growing up in an Air Force where, you know, we, we would all, we'd all come in on weekends. We would all make, we'd have these stoplight charts where we'd make everything that was not compliant with some AFI go away. Um, and I just remember how soul sucking that felt. Cause I was like, I, I don't even think this is making me better at my job. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm adjusting margins and binders and, and, um, you know, I, I think is when I had the opportunity to work in the Pentagon on my last job and, and sitting down with general Brown and he talked about the challenge of, you know, his memo we put out to the force was accelerate change or lose. And he just, he was dissatisfied with the level of, of, of movement on that. And I think it is because. You know, and, and the reason he put it in the memo is because we, we grew up in a compliance era. We scored ourselves more on the inspections and, and, and those kind of things than, than truly looking at ourselves for readiness. Another thing I think is really, really important is, you know, just because someone's name comes out in a promotion roster, just because they've completed PME, doesn't mean they're fully ready 
and, and assuming those roles as NCOs and senior NCOs. We've seen that. We're putting out, um, you can go to the Air University webpage and the foundational uh, resources, but this, this initiative called Prepping the Line, because we've realized is that, you know, there were some people who were fast-tracked fast to the ranks, but we never really looked at the checks and balances in the same way we would for our operational career fields on levels of progression for NCOs and senior NCOs and what we expect of them um, at, at, those, at those levels and those tiers. And so it's gonna take us some time, you know, where we actually are getting the level of, of, but I would say is they can't just do that on their own. We can't just criticize them for them. We have to take an active part in helping them do the kind of things exactly what you're talking about to where it builds those uh, repetitions to show what we value and what is the most important thing. Uh, because you have to make choices, but I, but I think as leaders too, is we have, we have a responsibility to really make sure that we reprioritize versus just telling everything's important, uh, completely telling, because you can empower people where it gets dangerous. And then, and then um, to, to your point is, they need to understand where the risk lines are. Uh, and also understand, I think the most important thing that we talk about is there's risk in staying where you're at. There's risk in status quo. And a lot of times we don't evaluate that risk um, and, and at the same time, the world is passing it up and we're actually putting the risk for when we actually have to get into a fight or have to do something because we're not as ready for that moment as we could be. So this, let me talk more about, about risk because uh, honestly, for the commanders out there, I think this is um, one of the hardest things that we ask you to do. Um, so one, you are wanting your airmen, big A, civilians at any level, to exercise disciplined initiative. You'll see that on the chart, right? What is that? So what you're really wanting them to do is exercise prudence, make prudent decisions, not reckless decisions, right? So if you're empowering them, you're not asking them to turn their brain off and just run headlong into the wall. Um, and and that is uh, that needs to be taught and supervised and again, debriefed. So um, they should be getting feedback on, and, and their pace should be metered. It shouldn't be reckless. Um, so risk acceptance, what does that entail? So um, if someone is coming to you and asking for a waiver, um, it doesn't matter what type of AFI it is. If they're not articulating a mitigation action in that waiver request, they have it wrong. All they're doing is passing you risk. The risk doesn't go away just because you signed the waiver. Um, so they should have to be, they should be forced to articulate that. If they don't, you have no idea what risk you're accepting. Now, the, the exception is it's just a bad AFI. And, and I would say that's generally not the case. Generally, there's a reason why the language is in there. We can debate whether it's at the right echelon, but if someone's asking you to waive something and they're not demonstrating to you how they're mitigating it, it doesn't mean you're not going to approve it, but you need to start collecting those because now if you're doing that across a number of activities, you're now accumulating risk and aggregating risk suddenly introduces, it's not linear, right? So the more, the more you simply wave and don't mitigate, the more likely you are um, to have one of those, the odds don't change. If there was a 30% chance of it happening yesterday, just because it's today doesn't, and it didn't happen, doesn't make it less likely. There's still a 30% chance of it happening. Nothing has changed, right? So. The fact that something didn't happen in the past doesn't change the odds in our world of it happening today. You need to be really cognizant of what you are being asked to waive. Um, is it risk to force? Is it risk to mission? Or is it both? Those are two different things. If it's health and welfare of your personnel, those are the same personnel that are getting your mission done. So. It's rare that you have risk to force that doesn't somehow impact risk to mission. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just, again, who is bringing you the risk and can they articulate how to mitigate it, whether it can be mitigated and, and what other risk that impacts? What are you aggregating that with? And then the last is at what level, what is the level that you should be accepting the risk at? Um, 
I would absolutely say if you don't know what your commanders have retained, like what authorities they have retained, you, your JA should have a printout of that. So make sure you're not accepting risk that your next hire has said, hey, you can't accept that. You have to come to me um, to have that conversation. Um, if you're a group commander, if you're not sharing your risk acceptance or mitigation experiences with your partners in crime in the other groups, um, I would strongly encourage you to do that. I would venture to guess you're having some of the very same conversations in your separate group command offices um, on different subjects. But the type of risk and the process that you go through to discuss whether you should be accepting it, how you're mitigating it, it should be very similar. It's a very difficult, this is, I think this is the hardest thing you do as a commander, is evaluate risk and make the decisions of whether to accept it or not. And if you are going to accept it, how to mitigate it. If your team is coming to you and simply asking you to accept risk without offering mitigation, and you're frustrated that that keeps happening, there is a process for that. We have people who are trained to help them do that. Your safety offices probably have some of them in it. Um, otherwise, I'd call the safety center. Um, but we have people who are trained in risk management. And so if, you, if your organization needs help with that, um, ask for assistance. So you're at a wing, I would start with your MAGCOM if it's not on your staff. If you have a NAF, you can go to the NAF staff and say, hey, we're having trouble with this. This is an A3, A3, right? It's not the safety functional. It's not the one because it's risk to personnel. It is risk to force, risk to mission. And the A3s on whatever that the first staff is that has one should be the one articulating to the commander. Commanders are the only ones who can accept or decline to accept risk. If you're talking about a supervisor accepting risk, you're talking about a different level of risk than I am. Um, supervisors shouldn't be waiving TOs. Like there's a reason why you go through that process, right? So it should be very clear um, what that threshold is for, for risk acceptance and, and when it needs to come to a commander and when it is simply disciplined initiative and exercising prudence. Um, to make a decision on how to execute a mission. All right, do we have any other questions out there before we, before uh, we get I'm bingo time? Guessing, man. We're not ready for the next question. We're not? Okay, not. you're not. put it in context. Okay. My A3 is, is mitigating the risk of the, of the question that he's staring at on his screen because he, he probably knows where this one might go. All right, Blaze, what do you got? Um, I think it's time, ma'am, in, in this... You know, in the, in the conversation, we, we the the thing that I have enjoyed that we've talked about over the past year is how, you know, you you uh, the real stat on uh, competence and confidence. Um, you know, I think I think that's 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 a really great conversation, ma'am. I think that that kind of rounds out. You know, how do you operationalize all these concepts? So yeah. Um, so I can describe while we're reading a question. Let me give you some good news because this is the operational force. I believe my my belief is. The operational force is making a huge difference. So if you're sitting out there thinking to yourself, man, we suck, like, yeah, get that out of your mind. So um, a year, I've been here a year and a half. And so when I first got here and rolled into that, that room of 600 captains at Polifka, um, it was, and the senior NCO Academy, it was a very different feel. Um, I was almost borderline angry, right? There was a little bit of a woe is me, crisis of confidence, um, I can't, uh, we can't, um, and that is gone. Like, so um, their ears are pinned back, they are leaning forward, um, they understand what we are asking them to do. It doesn't mean they, they know, you know, that they're proficient at doing it, but they are, they are inquisitive. Um, they are thirsting for more, and they are truly um, on task, I'd say, with regard to being mission focused. We had senior NCOs who would say, hey, I don't know why I'm learning this. I'm just going to go back to fill in the blank and do fill in the blank. And, you know, that was disheartening to hear. Like, but it, step one, right, acceptance. This is where we are. And we made them that way. 
right? So it's, they, they, that's the experience that they've had. They can change and they are embracing change. It takes time. Some of them move faster than the others, but the captains now are, are locked in, they are dialed in. And that didn't happen here at Air University. Mm -hmm. That happened out in your organizations. That is your squadron commanders, your DOs, your leaders, your first echelon civilians who've been down this path before. Like, so I, I get eye rolls here because I have civilians here who've been here a long time, right? And they're like, yeah, this is right where we were. Like everyone here thinks this is new and different. This is exactly the way we did it in the late 80s, early 90s, right? So for people who've been around that long. And so, yes, there's some truth to that. We, we haven't found ourselves in this circumstance in a long time. We can do this. Um, it, and quite frankly, um, we're in a much better spot um, because we're the Air Force. Like we're the, we're the ones who are the ones that open the box up, throw the instructions aside, and we just find a way to do it, right? We're the creative ones. Uh, we don't have a problem fighting above our weight. We know we're gonna be outnumbered by the Army. Um, we're technically savvy, we're innovative. All of this is in our DOA, DNA. We can do this. We are a highly maneuverable, agile force. Um, we just need to get some sets and reps and, and we can move this cruise ship quickly. Like the people are much easier to solve than deliver hypersonic weapons. I'll take, I'll take our airmen any day of the week. Okay. We have two questions, ma'am. The, uh, the, one of them has to deal with um, your comments about uh, risks. One of them has to do with uh, EPME. The first one is, uh, and I got to go verbatim. Okay. Do you feel that peacetime incentive structures favor risk averse leaders? If so, how do we change? So I think the challenge with, if you want to call it a peacetime construct, is it's exceedingly difficult for um, the lower echelons to actually perceive risk, right? So there, there's no sense of, ur that sense of urgency. If you're in Ukraine, if you're in Gaza, it is painfully, you are painfully aware um, of the need to be competent, capable, like it is, you are in a war fighting construct. Um, if most of you who, uh, you know, the majority of the dial ins are perhaps in the Northcom AOR, we certainly have Indo PACOM AOR and UCOM AOR on the lines. The closer you are to what I'll call um, a visible fight, um, the easier it is for you to articulate the risk of doing nothing to people, right? So, what is challenging is for almost five years now, we've had national defense strategy and guidance, which says there are no sanctuary areas. There aren't any, which means we should all, reg regardless of the combat geographic combatant command that we are sitting in, we should all be orienting ourselves towards the full spectrum of conflict. It is, it is exceedingly difficult to do that. If I were to walk outside the building today and the sun's out, the birds are chirping, um, everything looks wonderful. We're talking about holiday parties, right? That is a leadership challenge. So yes, I do believe it's harder. Um, that is why we, we're the C, we have the C prefix. It is the leadership challenge of our day because we don't ever want to be where Ukraine and Israel are right now. Right? We want it to always be an away game. We're the only team in, in any activity that I know that will take an away game over a home game any day of the week, right? And so, yes, it's, it's harder. And our nation, right down to the, the, you can go back to the Constitution and our founding principles. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. We are a nation that tends to take a first punch. We are disinclined towards uh, the use of force <laughs> before it is forced upon us. Um, you can call that a flaw. You can call it the soft underbelly, but it is part of what gives you the challenge of demonstrating to your airmen a sense of 
urgency, a sense of mission focus, and what the ramifications are and the risk associated with a failure to act. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. What was the second PME question? You got 10 uh, minutes. So yeah. the, the second question regarding EPME um, is, um, would, and if so, how, would you refocus our EPME to be more execution focused? Yeah, and I see the full question up on, on the, um, the chat as well. So um, I, I think we, we definitely, in the context of the question, also talks about, you know, push to make it more strategic. Um, certainly, if you're not tracking in, uh, in the past uh, couple of years, the Chief Master of the Air Force has asked to take a complete look at validating our, our enlisted uh, PME. Uh, we also, at the same time, she commissioned a, a group to get together uh, of not just people from PME, but different ranks across the Air Force, uh, also officers, and, and, and hey, reimagine uh, the future of PME. Uh, what that resulted in is uh, in the last six months, we, we've released the, the airmanship continuum. And what we're doing right now is now this 100 to 900 continuum that includes foundations that are elements that will happen at a base level between PME is now we're asking our, ourselves the question, well, what should happen and at what level? Uh, particularly, I think, is why we, we, we live in this information world now where things can happen very, very fast and information spreads very, very fast. While we want our airmen to be strategically aware, we want them to also be tactically relevant, uh, to be able to do things. So it's not just about the thinking side to understand that, but the actual actions they take you know, as leaders of their teams. Uh, particularly if we're going to operate uh, speed and in alignment through, through different echelons. And so what I would say is, is we've always, the strength of our, our service, and this is talked about both in the international partners, is, is our enlisted force, and we know that. And so we definitely want to balance those. We, we, we don't want the, to overdo it too much where they, where they don't get great at execution of what they do. And so from the PME lens, I would say it the, the, the brilliance of what we're trying to do here is not look at what happens in PME stays in PME, right? We, you've probably heard the term for that, we, hey, we want to re-blue people, but it has to be things that applied and actually make them better at their J-O-B. And, and, and at the same time, those things are not too far off of wherever, wherever unit they're coming from or wherever their background is, that, that when they come to an institutional level of training or education, that it's vastly different. And so it's got to be fused into the DNA of the progression of that airman. And what I think is good news is our career field managers, and we're going to be, we're going to be actually having a foundational competencies dot mil PF to look at what is the right progression at what level so we can balance those two things, again, being strategically aware and tactically relevant, relevant uh, to, to execute um, as needed at whatever echelon. Yeah, I think, I think um, for this audience too, since we have, probably a, a collection of command chiefs out there, um, potentially at two different echelons, the, the group and, and the wing. Um, I think we've learned a lot from the COVID experience that Air University has the ability to uh, get our content to be much more accessible in small bites and in modules to, to meet the, uh, particularly the senior NCO core um, where they are. Meaning some of you may have gotten pitched into a joint assignment or found yourself on a staff. Um, I know when I was at the Pentagon, I had senior NCOs showing up in the security forces director. They'd never been to the Pentagon before. They'd never been on a staff before. And we gave them like no training to show up. It was like, hey, you show up, figure it out, right? And so I think when, when, when you say, how do we get more strategic? It's not just about um, making sure you're, you have situational, situational awareness on the strategic environment. It's, hey, if I'm sending you to a fill in the blank, you're going to work in an AOC or you're in a, on a staff, even if it's you're on the ACC staff for the first time, like I should have content that I can give to you beforehand or deliver to you. If you can't come, or I should have a course that prepares you for that. Maybe it's a week, maybe it's two weeks. It might not be quote PME, but to, to Chief's point, it prepares you for your J-O-B. It gives you that little package skill set. Maybe it's a PPC code on your assignment. Um, we're trying to figure out right now, like at the at the MAGCOM staffs level, like our MAGCOM staffs on the officer side too, there's no training that they get. They just kind of show up. And we've gotten so small that there are very few field grade officers that get 
Well, first I went to a NAF staff, and then I got to go to a MAGCOM staff, and then I got to go to the Pentagon to be a staff. Like, hey, you're just, you're getting what you get. You might be going directly to the Pentagon. You might be directly going downrange into a, um, a war fighting staff construct. And we haven't provided you um, not just PME, but that skill set. And so we're, those are the conversations that we're having is, is how do we better prepare our airmen just for the, for the responsibilities and the tasks that they're facing every day. Um, and so we're going to have to do that by bringing the Air University brand into our oper operational units to a greater degree than we are right now. I'm not saying we do the training for you. Um, I'm a huge proponent that, look, you got plenty of instructors out in your wings. Like if you got senior NCO stripes on, guess what? I consider you an instructor. You've task certified somebody. Um, I want to have some standardization of content, but I want to leverage the leadership and the, and the expertise that you have out there in your wings um, to strengthen that supervisory bond, that leadership bond. Um, your airmen should be looking to the personnel in your units um, to learn those skill sets not necessarily defaulting to, well, let's go to the AU website and, and see what we can find. Um, so we want to get that content into the hands of our command chiefs, uh, you know, at Echelon and, and the SELs, send out some NPTs, um, centralize some training and, and see what we can do. Like Ag foundations is, is going really well. I think we're, it's going better than I would have predicted this early uh, in the development. But uh, this is my ask now, right? I'm going to be a demanding customer. We need your feedback. Right, so for those of you who may have experienced it because you're on the early end of delivery, um, please let us know how we're doing. Um, ask for more. And, uh, and thank you um, for helping us make your airmen better. We're down to three minutes, so I think that's, that's final comment. So my final comment is if there was a question you, you just didn't want to ask on the chat or you think of it later, um, send us an email and I will get you an answer. Um, and if there's a way we can do this better, again, we didn't plan to do this this way. Apologies that you didn't get to get this in the classroom. We've got one more iteration of this, um, but your relief will be getting this in their commander's courses and in the, the chiefs are coming. We're doing it as command teams now. Um, so, so just let us know. I think However you RSVP'd, RSVP is the wrong word. However you communicated to us that you were going to be participating today, it might have been Colonel Marsicek. He's the um, Commander's Professional Development School and the Vice at Acre. Uh, shoot him an email and I'll, we'll get you an answer. I'll give you final comments, please. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, so happy holidays, everybody. Thank you guys for joining us again. I, 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 if you didn't know, um, what I think is really great is we actually are, are doing this a lot more as as teams. Um, you know, PME is traditionally you know the officer and enlisted, but the only in the past two years where the the wing commander course and group commander course has shifted to command team course. And I, I really love that there's a lot of shared conversations where we can actually look at each other and 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 learn from each other and understand how we will execute as a team because we know how we employ forces. That's exactly how it's going to be. And so uh, thank you guys for being the great teammates you are. Again, there's a lot going on at Air University for us to, to, to not just think about Air University when you come and, and sit in a seat while you're here or log into some device, but it actually helps you out in operational force. So let us know how we can do that better. Uh, happy holidays again, and thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us.